Thanks for listening to this Word in Your Ear podcast. If you'd like to get early access to all our productions ad-free, priority booking for our live events, and to take part in our weekly quiz, go to patreon.com slash wordinyourear for more details. Well, welcome to another Word in Your Ear. When you look back at the various uh, revolutionary British subcultures, you wonder if there was a more uh, exciting and influential and dangerous and thrilling time than that of the Teddy Boys and the late 50s rock and roll tours that sparked riots of uh, of mischief and pure, unadulterated joy. We wish we'd been there. And uh, all of this is captured uh, in a fantastic new book called Teddy Boys by Max Deshane. Max, very nice to see you. Nice to see you. Where do we find you? Sorry, where do we find you? Where are you, yeah. I'm in London. Excellent. Yeah. Now, you, you're, we, we, were, we wish we'd been there. You clearly are younger than us. So, I mean, wh- when was your, the first time you became aware of the notion of Teddy Boys? Well, I, I'm, uh, I'm from Portsmouth, and uh, they were always, that was totally a stronghold for, for Ted's very early on. And uh, as you probably know, it's where the first homegrown uh, British rock gig happened, uh, the 1956 um, tour started at the Theatre Royal Portsmouth uh, for a British group. Um, but I remember in the 60s, our local fun fair, you know, so being maybe five or six years old, you go down to the fun fair on the seafront, the South Sea, and everybody who was running the uh, the Dodgem cars, you know, with, with the shooting galleries, uh, it was all the old Teds, basically. It was, it was. Yeah. yeah. And this was, Mark, Mark and I were only true. talking about this yesterday. My main memory of Teds was fairgrounds. Yeah. Yeah. You always saw them at fairgrounds. They were yeah. running the rides and so forth. Carry on. Go on. And uh, and it felt like the music that was playing, uh, these days you, you get techno or whatever uh, yeah. at fun fest. It was always Runaway by Del Shannon. And, yes. uh, and yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, that to me is the classic. Every time I hear that song, which is a wonderful song, it reminds me of fairgrounds. And um, my parents' generation, they, they were basically the people who were going out dancing in the 50s and and getting into Jerry Lee and Elvis and, and whatever. And one of my uncles was a Ted in Slough. And uh, so it was always Sunday afternoon television. They'd show Rock Around the Clock, maybe in 1967, 68, uh, the Bill Haley film, uh, formerly very uh, controversial, but family entertainment by those days. We'd always watch it. We'd always watch the Elvis films if they came along. Um, I just grew up, grew up around it, and uh, I loved the music. And the look, as you say, dangerous, but uh, fascinating. Because uh, you would see them in the streets in those days. So is, a, it, is it possible to, to pinpoint where it starts? Or is it one of those things that just disappears in the mist of history? Um, no, you, you can, really. The, the, uh, um, straight after the war, 1945, 46, uh, the fashion industry, the, high, uh, the haute couture industry, started selling Edwardian uh, women's fashions. Um, so that was Christian Dior's new look. Uh, it was not remotely new. It was, it was totally Edwardian. And after a couple of years in the late forties, that being incredibly successful, that the, hair, the women's hairstyles as well, um, Savile Row and the top end of British tailoring thought, hang on, we can sell this to the men as well. And they were aiming at people in guards, regiments, minor members of the Royal family, that sort of thing. It was really expensive, but they were trying to get everyone to look like Edwardian times, which obviously is where the name comes from. So uh, this is what this Edward is, velvet Lee. collars, presumably, yes. is it? Vel- and sort of slightly draped coats or? Yeah, uh, uh, what we'd call a, uh, a fingertip drape. In other words, when you stand up, where do your fingertips come down to uh, halfway down your thighs, basically? Oh, so right. Long, longer than was normal. Uh, drain pipe trousers were much, much thinner than the Oxford bags that had really been in uh, in fashion since the 30s. Um, so that was one of the ways of telling someone who was into Edwardian things was just these uh, um, narrow trousers. Plus, crepe soled shoes were very popular, and uh, the Duke of Edinburgh was wearing. I was going to say all of this worn by the Duke of Edinburgh, unlikely fashion hero. <laughs> no, it's, inter- it's interesting. Describe what he wore because we always like to think that you know fashion always comes up from the street. Well, it doesn't yeah. always, does it? You know, yeah. Um, it, it was. Uh, I, I love quoting um, contemporary reports because they give you something of an insight, however distorted, into what the prevailing orthodoxy was. And uh, all these fashion journalists, both male and female, were saying, 
right, let's look at Paris or let's look at what the Taylor and Cutter magazine is saying, because that's what we're going to be wearing next year. It was dictated from the top down. So what was odd about the Teds is that after a couple of years of upper class people wearing the Edwardian styles from 1950, 51, suddenly um, what would have been seen as working class oiks from the Elephant and Castle, uh, the, the grotty bits of uh, Notting Hill, the East End, started adopting that style. And one of the reasons for that was they could, they could suddenly afford it in a time of full employment. So right, it, which it really cool. annoyed the press, didn't it? Because oh, this was yeah. the first kind of generation that found it really easy to get jobs and had money. The first generation of kind of teenagers, really. That's right. Uh, the teenager as a concept was being invented. And if you think about their, their parents, uh, my, my, my dad's father, um, he'd, he lost everything in the, in the Depression. He, he ran a little shop. Nobody paid. So he, um, he moved to Slough and became a bus conductor. It was... It was but moved down from up north. That was the that was the only job he could get, uh, and you know that was that was fine with him. It was money. So, but the idea of having spare money to go dancing four or five nights a week, go to the cinema all the time, and go to your local tailor and say, "Excuse me, mate, I want a velvet collar. I want the jacket this long. Um, I want narrow trousers," which is what these teenage kids were doing. Um, that was revolutionary. I think it caused a lot of re resentment generally. Um, that whole we fought in the war for people like that. No, absolutely. And, yeah, and yeah. Now, you, now you're doing this. Speaking of the war, where does this generation stand in terms of national service? Are they doing this before they get called up for national yes. service? They are. Yeah, that's right. So it's, yeah. Yeah. it's a late teenage thing, isn't it? It's, it's well, your, your earliest Ted's, um, a lot of them, as I say, had just left school. Some of them were still at school. So um, f 15, my mum left school at 15, became a hairdresser, and that was really... You're in the adult working world, but you're you're 15 and you're trying to define yourself. And for the for the teenage boys, you've got three years before this big spectre of the government comes, yes. comes and gets you and puts you in uniform. It's quite interesting. You look at the pictures in your book, in your picture section. They mm -hmm. do look young, don't they? They look, they look 16, 17. It's very yeah, distinctly yeah. Uh, different. Yeah. The chaps, the chaps on the on the front cover. Uh, that was the old Tottenham Royal Ballroom, the uh, the, the Mecca. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's walking distance from where, from where I live, and you can tell from the age of those guys that they are they're fifteen or sixteen, and they've all got slightly individual because they're you're going to. It's what the mods then got into. Um, you you make your own statement. They don't, they haven't all put on a uniform. It's all slightly differing because it's individual choice, um, and. Uh, yeah, people hadn't seen that. That's why the subtitle of the book is The First Youth Revolution. By that, I'd, I mean the first one in this country of young people defining themselves in that particular way, which was then followed on by the, the mods, the hippies, the the, the punks, et cetera, et cetera. So, so, th so though we tend to associate this in retrospect with rock and roll. Sure. The, one of the points you make in the book is this this existed before rock and yeah. roll, didn't it? It, it latched on to rock and roll. Can I, tell us about that. Three or four years before. Uh, it's not that rock and roll, obviously, as we know, it was, it was, still, it was already around in the States. You've got Sam Phillips recording uh, Rocket 88 by, uh, you know, I, basically Ike Turner's band in 51. But 51 over here, you're going to be listening to Dickie Valentine, Absolutely. Max Bygraves, yeah. Neil Lynn. Joe Lawson is orchestra. If you went dancing, which obviously the Teds did, um, you would go to the Hammersmith Palais uh, and you'd get Elvis Costello's dad, Ross McManus, as the featured vocalist. It was good stuff, but it was not rock and roll. And you have to go to December 1954 before the first genuine American rock and roll record breaks into the British charts, and that is Bill Haley's cover of uh, Joe Turner's Shake, Rattle and Roll. Um, so... Ted's were dancing to big band jazz. I don't think they were dancing to Dickie Valentine. But, but, uh, no. And one of the yeah. exciting things about going to see the rock and roll movies, uh, Rock Around the Clock and stuff, was, was being in a room where you could hear rock and roll that loud, yes. presumably, wasn't it? Yeah, uh, definitely. Which, which was responsible for getting people to rip up seats. Sure. That was the effect, wasn't it? Uh, the, some of the big London cinemas, you could get 4,000 people in them. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. Imagine being in a bunch of teenagers going to see 
the key film that really broke it to people was going to see Blackboard Jungle in 55. Yes. And the opening title music is Rock Around the Clock by Bill Haley. And uh, Keith Richard, I'm quoting, it's, it's a Rolling Stone interview with him from about 71, where they asked him about his earliest days. And he said, everybody went to see that film and nobody talked about the film. They just said, oh, did you hear the music, man? You know, because among 4,000 people, this stuff blasting out so much louder than you could put, your little dance set is not going to compete with that. Um, and it blew people away. He was so, in 12 Black, Vault of Jungle, Black Vault Jungle, they, um, I was listening to an interview recently with uh, Glenn Ford's son, who right. was, it reckons he's the person who, who, who got that, tune on the opening of that film because they're originally considering big band jazz as yes. well and yeah. it's a, it's a really interesting film because it's very kind of anti-teenage isn't it it's, it is well um evan hunter uh, who wrote the book and then the screenplay he he had been a teacher at a very tough school uh, in the new york uh, public school system uh, and uh, had a very hard time so he was just telling it i mean he went on obviously to write the great um um American uh, cop uh, series, the what is it, the fifty second uh, precinct series. Uh, so he he was not looking at dewy eyed or trying to romanticise <laughs> teenage gangs because um, he'd been on the rough end of it. Yeah, yeah. Because the they're... majority of the film is about the kids smashing up the classrooms. Yes. Isn't it? Yeah, and so many British tabloids latched onto this, saying, "Oh, we're going to have this here, and this is disgraceful." And the American ambassador. Uh, over here, uh, Claire Booth Luce, who was married to the guy who ran Time magazine, she tried to have it banned from being shown internationally just because she was horrified. What impression is this given, giving of, uh, of American culture? Um, so so for you... people's, people's first exposure to rock and roll as being an exciting thing came via the cinema rather yes. than the jukebox or Definitely. the live show or anything like that. You couldn't look to the BBC for uh, this kind of thing uh, at all. You weren't going to hear, I mean, Elvis from 54 was making his brilliant rockabilly records at Sun, but um, uh, I once interviewed uh, uh, John Peel uh, for another book, uh, and he said, those were great records, but we'd never heard any of that, no, you which is why Heartbreak Hotel in the summer of 56 on RCA records, he said that was a total bombshell for all of us because we hadn't had the build-up. So you, you are not going to hear rock and roll on the BBC until 1956 when the sheer, the economics of it, these things were selling so much that every, the industry had to take notice. Uh, before that, they could just sneer at it and ignore it. So when would you say what year was kind of peak Teddy Boy? Is it possible uh, to say that? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, uh, the name. You have to have a name. Um, and... If there's the equivalent of the Pistols being on the uh, uh, Bill Grundy show, which is what catapulted them from, you know, the, the early 76, you've just got the famous Pistols live review in the enemy saying, uh, don't look over your shoulder, but the Sex Pistols are coming. That's February that year. And I, I was reading the enemy at that time. and that So I knew who they were because of good journalists. Uh, but the tabloid thing, when does it get to the sort of a granny in um, the north of Scotland, or just everybody in the street is going to know about it. And for the Teds, that is um, uh, well, July the 2nd, 1953. Uh, and and that is, unfortunately, that was uh, a, a fatal stabbing on Clapham Common, which became a hugely controversial and well-reported Old Bailey murder trial in the summer of '53. And it was between two small groups of uh, youths who liked dressing in Edwardian clothing, uh, a kind of dis dispute that could have uh, turned into just a punch-up. Um, but it, it was a murder, and that shocked the country. And their girlfriends, one of their girlfriends being interviewed at the Old Bailey, said, uh, we wouldn't dream of going out with anyone who wasn't wearing Edwardian clothing. Uh, the Edwardians, or as we like to call them, the Teddy Boys. Right. And that made yes. the front page of the Daily Express at the beginning of September 53. And that, that name spread like wildfire. It was being used up and down the country by a month later by judges sentencing people. The There's a brilliant bit where you talk about um, 
press over the years and the way they've described various youth cultures, and you said that the hippies were, were described as, as seemed to be practising free love and were drug addicts, exactly, punks were yeah. sniffing glue and mugging old ladies, yeah. long-haired metalers were receiving satanic messages. So how were how were the Teds portrayed at that the time? The Teds were considered... If you... Uh, I would say that... I mean, I, I was a teenage Pistols fan in 76 and Ramones, and I loved that stuff. And I was dressing... <clears throat> in homemade punk gear, and suddenly people, you walk down the street, people think you're going to m- literally mug an old lady or spit at them. And um, that's not what I was into. I was into the music. With Ted's, um, if you start with a murder rather than just swearing on television, <laughs> um, yeah. that's pretty hardcore. They Very soon, anyone who was causing trouble, any young person smashing up a cinema, smashing up a cafe, which young people had always done. I don't mean all of them, but there'd always been youth trouble at cinemas, going back to Edwardian times. There'd always been um, groups of yobs uh, causing trouble at cafes. Um, everything became blamed on them, and they were, it became a, a shorthand. Instead of saying hooligan, they said Ted. So what is typical behaviour associated with them as far as the 50s generation is concerned? Uh, swinging a, a bike chain, often a sharpened bike chain, carrying a flick knife, um, beating people up randomly, and destroying any building they might go into. And carrying um, koshies, didn't they? Koshies, yeah, they, they handkerchiefs full of coins. Is that right? Good point. They inherited because they were a uh, they were the classic fifties moral panic, but they inherited the fallout from the previous moral panic, which was the kosh boy. And that came along in 1951, the Daily Herald, national newspaper, left-leaning. They ran a series of articles called Kosh Boy, uh, all about, yeah, just robbers, young people, who would kosh you over the head and steal your money. Uh, Somebody jumped on that immediately, wrote a play called Kosh Boy. It was a huge success. Uh, A cheap film company optioned it (laughs) for films and made a film called Kosh Boy, starring Joan Collins as the uh, 17-year-old gangster's mole. That's right. Still, still um, with us, Joan. Still oh, with us. Still with us, and God, God bless <laughs> yeah. her. And, uh, and the, uh, what I, I, that was made at uh, Riverside Studios in Hammersmith. It's a great little film. And they're basically Ted's. They're just not called Ted's. And they, um, one of them is, he's just got a new suit, uh, and his gang's saying, oh, uh, you know, l- like, the, uh, like the suit, uh, n- nice drape, you know, um, uh, when you're going back for your final fitting. In other words, it's not finished yet. Um, but the focus puller, uncredited focus puller on that is Nicholas Rogue. All right. It's amazing, uh, it's amazing when, you, when you watch any of those films that pop up on Talking Pictures TV yeah. on a rainy afternoon from the early 50s, there's always a kind of teddy boy thug yes. figure, isn't there? You know? Yeah, there is. They became, in, in those kind of films and also in, in cheap pulp paperbacks, they became instantly... A, um, a walk-on figure when you needed a paragraph or two or a scene in a film of uh, of violence. Uh, the it's classic. shorthand for, for violence it, it and is, thuggery, it, isn't it? Yeah, uh, you, you know the classic Raymond Chandler advice, if, you're, if you get stuck writing a crime novel, uh, when in doubt have two men come through the door with guns in their hands. Um, <laughs> in the 50s, it was when in doubt, have a couple of Ted's le- uh, loitering outside a, a dance hall and then you know there's going to be trouble. It's it's not going to be sort of the middle-aged bank employee that's going to make everything kick off. Right. Now, what, what about the, the business? So when, when the moment of Ted seems to have passed... Yeah. Um, you, go, go on, tell us about that. When yeah. is that moment? Go on. Well, they didn't really outlast the 50s, and and as, as, as you know, any kind of youth movement, how long do they last? I mean, when's the classic punk era... There's a lot of people that in the game were saying it's over by the end of 77. Basically. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's not much more. The flashpoint uh, is, doesn't last very long. With mods, by the time I've, I've seen original mods say, uh, by the time people were fighting on the beaches in, in 64, most of the originals had already got out of the game. These, these were, um, you know, because the modernists have been floating around since 58. Um and the original goth movement, I mean, that that had mutated wildly by uh, the mid-80s. So the, the thing that really made people change, by 1959, you've got Italian-influenced fashions coming in, 
and what really put the lid on it uh, fashion-wise, look at uh, the influence of Dol La Dolce Vita uh, being shown over here in 1960, but also the, uh, the jazz that the early modernists were getting into, the, the clothing that your typical cool jazz outfit from America might be wearing, which has still got the drainpipe trousers, but it's Italian, uh, much shorter jacket. It's a sharp look, but it's not a velvet collar Ted look. But, but also the Beatles must have put the tin lid uh, uh, on. Totally. By, the, the, you yeah. know, the, 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 goodbye to Brill Cream, you know, completely different without, hair. Without different doubt. And of, and of course, they, they were old Ted's. Uh, and, yeah. Uh, you know, I think Ringo was the last. Ringo still a Ted, really, in the in the on the first album cover. Yeah, exactly. He he was he was uh, refusing to go the uh, uh, the uh, Hamburg uh, existentialist route for a little while. But yeah, there's there's two signifiers in October '62 that I point out because um, the first Beatles single and the first James Bond film happened. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And those are two. Imagine you're a young a young guy looking for a role model, a teenager, and you want to know what to look like. There you've got the Beatles and you've got Sean Connery. Uh, and very soon uh, you've got, uh, I mean, the, the Rolling Stones are already living at Edith Grove down the wrong end of the King's Road by 62. Uh, and their hair's getting longer. And, and particularly the pretty things, their hair is very long. Uh, so there's just another way to, to look. It's not to say there weren't Ted's around in 62. There were, there were loads of them. Uh, but um, they were seen as yesterday's man. This is this is the yeah. thing. Isn't there was something it? very sad about there my memories of, t of the lone Ted's. Yeah. You always used to see a Ted pushing a pram with a, yeah. With, yeah. with a woman in a beehive. Yeah, and, and yeah. You, they really felt like the world had passed them by. That's it. There's there's a because the great thing about newspaper archives, as you can probably tell from the book, I love old newspapers and not not just the the national ones. I like looking in scurrilous publications from wherever and, and uh, fanzines and things. But um, if you do a search now, you can do it electronically under certain terms. And it turned up, there's uh, Matthew Paris in the 90s when he was the um, political correspondent for the Times. Uh, at the beginning of that decade, he called, he was talking about Gorbachev and he called him looking as out of place uh, as a teddy boy dad at parents' evening. Uh, <laughs> and he clearly liked that phrase because about two years later, he was referring to Eric Heffer, the MP, yeah. as looking as out of place as a teddy boy dad <laughs> at a parents' evening. And then a couple of years later, he picked on somebody else and he used exactly the same the, phrase. That and, occupational and, hasn't been a columnist, that yeah, is. I, think, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's fair enough. I think we all... We all uh, Recycling. ...our favourite tropes. <laughs> Absolutely. Worth it. Worth repeating. But, but the we, whole notion of Ted's was kept alive by various things, wasn't it? And there were tours, Little Richard and Chuck Berry and sure. Dion and the Everly's... Yeah. Touring through the 60s. I mean, we'll, we'll get on to the revival, the big show in Wembley in mm. 72 in a moment, but that must have kept the flame alive, must it, have, those it, people touring. It was a much better time to see the original American rockers in the 60s over here uh, than it was in the 50s, simply because the Musicians' Union Band that was still around in most of the 50s, that, uh, as, as again, I'm sure you know, it was a reciprocal thing, Musicians' Union over here saying... Right, you can send one of your people over here. You can send Jerry Lee Lewis over here, but we've got to send you Ted Heath and his orchestra, or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. And the Americans mostly said, "No thanks, not not an equivalent." Uh, so it's an absolute tragedy that we didn't get something like the. There were talk. There was talk in '56 of one of the the great Alan Freed package shows coming over here. Can you imagine that? Where where you would get screaming Jay Hawkins. And Buddy Holly and the Crickets, and uh, as you say, Dion and the Belmonts, and about ten other people, all on the same bill. Mm. Um, we started to get it by the late the late fifties, and the bombshell really over here for live American rock and roll was the February and March fifty seven Bill Haley tour, uh, which absolutely um, stunned people. And then the Buddy Holly tour the following year. I think the fifty seven tour is the one that uh, Ted Carroll, who went on yes. to form Chiswick Records, I think yeah. he. Um, I think in the book he's a description. You interview him about that, and it's absolutely amazing. Where did he see? Was it he saw it Dublin? In Dublin, that, that, Dublin, and he says it was just they, people were just so high that they went yeah. out and just sort of rioted afterwards, didn't they? Just out of just excitement. Yeah. You know? He said they were. I mean, he was. I think four, he was a fourteen-year-old schoolboy, and I, I've known Ted for years, but I'd never known until he said to me. He started out because I said I want to talk to you about Teddy Boy. He said, well, of course, you know my name's David. It's not Ted. Oh, uh, right. Uh, right. Oh, very good. I was thinking how perfect that was. He was yeah. called Ted. And, uh, he That's was, great. 
He was a teenage rock and roll fan at school and he loved the teddy boy look. And so he got hold of his trousers one day when his mum was out and her sewing machine uh, and narrowed them extremely by hand. Didn't, he said he didn't really know what he was doing. Went into school and he'd got the haircut and he got these trousers and his mate started calling him Ted and he's been Ted ever since. And um, uh, I had no idea that he'd seen the Bill Haley tour in 57. And uh, in my book, I run that over the course of about two pages verbatim because it's this electrifying description. It's fantastic. He was giving me a blow-by-blow account of what they did and how it went. Um, 65 years later, or whatever it was, um, it made such an impression. He said they came out and just were literally dancing on the top of cars. Can you imagine what, what effect that is on a bunch of school kids? Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, also, it strange looking at it from our perspective, that it was a kind of fogeyish middle-aged man who was the centre of this attraction, you know, yes. but that wasn't a problem, was it? No. No one, none of them thought of Bill Haley as a square, did they? No, no, and and he, was, he wasn't. he uh, was If you, he was pretty early on, obviously he was covering songs when he started out, but then he started writing, I mean, he wrote Crazy Man Crazy, for instance, which is, uh, you know, that's a great song before he was uh, really big, and... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, that's what Ted said. This was not the uh, the sort of sadder figure of later years. This was actually really electrifying. Uh, nobody's seen anything like that before. Then, 58, you get Buddy Holly, incredibly important. And the Beatles saw that. John Peel saw that. Uh, Malcolm McLaren saw that. And the following year, finally, you get Gene Vincent, and that's uh, stunning. And Gene was touring here all the time in the 60s. So was Jerry Lee, uh, and so was Little Richard, Roy Orbison, um, so yeah, that was drawing an audience of Ted's all the way through the sixties, but they were just going to see their favorite music, regardless of whether, um, psychedelic, whatever was, was in, in vogue at the time. They didn't care. But then there was the, the, the great kind of the, the Wembley show yeah. in the, what's that? 72? 72. 72. Yeah. yeah. Hey, tell us about that. Um, yeah. What were they keying into? Was that the time that, of, I think. I think basically you'd had the the Ralph Nader rock and roll revival shows uh, starting at the very end of the 60s in America, and they'd made a lot of money. I mean, these days it's absurd, isn't it? They're, they're rounding up people whose peak career had been less than 10 years possibly yeah, earlier. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And they're calling them oldies but goldies. <laughs> yeah. uh, I've always hated the phrase oldies because it's just insulting the whole history of popular music. Uh, I remember buying a Gene Vincent record uh, in about 1974 and coming back to school in my lunch hour in Portsmouth. And my my classmates just going, you know, because you come in with a record, it's like, what have you got there then? And, and it was literally, what do you want to listen to that old rubbish for? I'm sure. And it, I'm Gene sure. had only died in 1971 and the records yeah. on it were only 15 years yeah, yeah. old. Uh, yeah. Which makes Nirvana ancient history. Absolutely, not, yeah. Even yeah. the Strokes. Not that I'm interested in in that, but um, so yeah, and Bloodwind Pig have got an album out. So what are you wasting well, your time listening to? All, all bets are off, exactly. <laughs> and uh, so it is. It, it's um, it's funny how this very recent past had been considered to be uh, so back from the dawn of time, just because. Fashions and music had changed about every two years. You had, look at fashions from 1965, for instance, compared to the sort of Afghan coat, wearing a bell around your neck. Um, look at what Clapton looked like, for instance, in, in the Blues Breakers, and then look what he looked like once he'd seen him. Uh, a few um, months later, it's, am- it's, a, it's amazing. If you look at Eric Clapton, we were, I think we were doing this not long ago, Mark, weren't we? Yeah, you we look were. at him for one year in the 60s, yeah. and he's looked totally changed, yeah. like three times. It's That's right. I, I, wrote, I wrote A History of the King's Road uh, a few years ago, and that uh, that was very much, you, you can watch, uh, the core era is the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and in the number of major changes, yeah, and of course, yeah. the fashion boutiques up and down that street were reflecting them, such that then by 71, when you have McLaren and Westwood setting up uh, at 430 Kings Road, the shop that eventually became Sex and then Seditionaries, you're selling tele- Teddy Boy draped jackets. Yeah. And uh, the person, advi- their advisor and the bloke who's supplying all the vintage records is Ted Carroll. Yeah. And uh, they went and ran a stall in 72, at the um, Wembley Rock and Roll Festival, 
which had whatever little Richard Jerry Lee, um, but who was the opening? I mean, the MC5 played at that. So yeah, it was a strange, extraordinary, strange event. So who who were the crowd there? Were they original Ted's or were they revivalists? Uh, it was a mixture. Uh, uh, often, if people do Google searches on on uh, sorry uh, the searches on um, the Getty website and the Mirapix website, looking say picture researchers looking for you tap in Teddy Boys nine times out of ten it will show you the 1972. <laughs> yeah. Oh right, and sure. So many of them have got they're wearing a drape, but their hair is far too long and much more seventies. And the, the, maybe the woman with them is in platform boots and hot pants, literally. Uh, and lots of people in the crowd are just general sort of off-the-peg hairy rock fans that you might also have got at the Reading Festival. There. A lot of denim waistcoats going yes, on. Yes, that kind I remember of remember I've seen those pictures, yeah. And, and uh, I've been fortunate. My books had a reasonable number of reviews, you know, which is lovely to see. But most of the picture researchers, what they've gone with is a 1970s shot. Yeah. My book is, is about the fifties, and those guys look very, very different. Peter uh, researchers are all twelve years old, you know. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah, it's 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 uh, the context just isn't isn't uh, isn't so much there. But yeah, I've seen lots of photographs, and obviously there's that great film of of the uh, the seventy two uh, uh, rock festival, and you can see the crowd is is a real mixture. I've I started going to. I think the first time I saw Jerry Lee Lewis was at the Rainbow in uh, 1978, supported by, uh, they introduced him as Duane Eddy, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, <laughs> and um, most of the audience there was Ted's. Uh, and they were definitely quite a lot older than me. So I think you had a lot of originals. Right. Then. But there was a sort of Ted theme that was kept going from, from groups like Wizard and Shawaddy Waddy and people who, yes. which must have been influenced by that event, mustn't they? Because they yeah, kind of well, kept it alive. I think Roy Wood, Roy Wood was genuinely, I mean, you listen, you listen to the stuff he was writing, it was magnificent. Right from the days of the move, um, they knew their son Rockabilly and their, their you know, they're, they're throwing in a little bit of, Roy was always chucking in a bit of the Phil Spector wall of sound, but... Um, he deeply loved 50s rock and roll. And the Great Wizard album, I think it's 1974, uh, Introducing Eddie and the Falcons, uh, okay. every track of that is a sort of loving pastiche of a different type of 50s record. There's a Gene Vincent rewrite. There's a Del Shannon rewrite. And they're wearing drapes and they're in a transport cap on the cover. I'll tell you who else yeah. used to do this. <laughs> it's good to be reminded of this. Mm. Fleetwood Mac, the original Fleetwood yes. Mac. Yes, absolutely. To, but a B-side out by supposedly by Earl Vincent and the Valiant That's called it. Somebody's Gonna Get Their Head Kicked In oh, Tonight. Yes. Great song. Yeah. And Jeremy Spencer used to slick back his hair, yeah. put a drape yeah. jacket on, yeah, and, yeah. and do a rock and roll bit in the middle of their set, didn't he? That's it. I think it was around in the same way that uh, the great Viv Stanshaw from the Bonzos. He's he's an old Ted from South End. And uh you, you then go forward to his solo career, and he, he puts out uh, uh, an LP called Teddy Boys Don't Knit. Because That's right. At the same time, he was a Teddy Boy. He also got heavily into crochet. And, and <laughs> <half> of, <laughs> as I say, that I grew up with this. My, that is, I grew up with this in my family, and I, I think the 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 cliche about Ted's is that they were all mindlessly violent. They were sort of cro magnon, knuckle dragging. Uh, and, of, and often because of the Notting Hill race riots, which the media blamed them squarely for them, whereas it's a much more complex story than that. Um, and I was just thinking, hang on, my uncle wasn't like this, and other people in my family were not like this, and people I've met were not like this, and Ted Carroll was not like this, and Viv Stanchion yeah. was not like this. So I wanted to broaden it out because I thought, I mean, how many books have there been about punk? or mod, or a lot of the other youth movements have been given their day in the sun and, and have been considered from lots of different angles. Um, and this one really hadn't. Uh, but yes, uh, uh, I was I was a glam rock kid, and so you'd watch Top of the Pops. There's Mud doing, you know, again, in Drape Jazz, yeah. uh, yeah. with Les Gray doing his favourite Elvis impersonation and doing it very well, actually. Um, <laughs> It, it was around the, the early 70s. It wasn't just Malcolm McLaren with drape jackets. Uh, there was a lot going on. 
Well, look, there it all is, the um, the full story, uh, Teddy Boys by Max Tishane, um, which is out now. It's terrific. Yeah. Very good. Thanks, Max. Very lovely to talk to you.